Hello, welcome to PC Chess Club. Season 1, episode 16. If you guys like this video, we're going to do a lot more chess. We're going to speed up the early opening segments. I think they're taking too long. We're gonna have more chess in the videos. We're gonna still keep the intros. Let's go ahead and get on with it. This one says mediocrity. Remember the average is simply the best of the poorest and the poorest of the best. A little smiley for you. This is the mini poster of the week. Anybody with kids or grandkids, this is a real good poster. Enjoy. Are the books of the week and the games of the week. You guys enjoy. We'll put these under the document camera here in a minute. We brought back perplexus and we've uh, kept brain strain. You guys see a look at it. Looks like somebody's been playing with it. <laughs> Definitely. I don't, I don't think they got them all untangled. I think they did good at getting them tangled up, but not getting them untangled. And these are the games of the week puzzle of the week. You can get these at uh, Walmart or Toys R Us or online. You might pick them up on eBay. Take a look at that game.
Hope you guys enjoyed that. Here's how you play it. So take a look at this last one. Bear with, we're almost done. Looks like it'd be a fun game to play. This week is about change and transition. Follow the Tao. Tao is a Chinese word meaning the way or the path. Taoism is an Eastern philosophy based on the principle that life involves ceaseless movement from one form to another. Problems arise when we attempt to resist or control the natural pattern of change. Harmony can be restored by following the Tao. That is, by going with the flow, accepting the ever-changing pattern of life without judgment or resistance. And the second one is 825 that was 824 825 the river you cannot step twice into the same river for other waters are continually flowing in Her heraclitus 540 to 480 bc and we'll do um, we'll do 829 and 830 830 first giving up the chain giving up the struggle change comes most quickly when we give up struggling against who we are for this is the one thing we cannot change 829 life's flow just as the laws of nature reign over all living things our lives follow a natural pattern that is woven into the larger tapestry of creation if you are unable to fulfill your wishes in a situation it may be that you are swimming against the current try letting go and trusting in the natural flow of events whatever is yours will come to you in due course that's our meditation for this week we're going to have a segment now about healing through humor so our 
I'll read you one from here. Fabulous jokes from the happy covers. Here's one you guys will enjoy. It's called Kids Say the Cutest Things. This one right here. Daddy's trick. A little boy greeted his aunt with a hug and said, I'm glad to see you. Now maybe daddy will do the trick he's been promising to do. The aunt was curious. What trick is that? The little boy replied, I heard daddy tell mommy that he would climb the walls if you came to visit us again. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And here's another one. We'll throw in one more about female logic. A little girl has just finished her first week of school. I'm just wasting my time, she said to her mother. I can't read, I can't write, and they won't let me talk. <laughs> Let's go on with the uh, memory segment. You can have all the chef knowledge and all the chef books in the world, but if you can't remember what you studied or what you read, what that is, you're not going to be able to use it. This one from your memory, a user guide. And what does it have to do with chess? I'll show you what it has to do with chess. I think we have one in here that might just apply. Did that one in another video. Okay, here we go. Capacity and limitations. Hold on. Now, you guys go ahead and take a look at this. I want you guys to see this. This is going to be a segment we're going to do on working memory. You can see this. It's a picture, a little girl counting on her fingers. Now, I'm only going to hit the high points, but you guys feel free to read this. Okay, right here, this is about working memory. He said, we decided to step back from the complexity and ask a single basic question. What is short-term memory for? The patient with a memory span of only two digits seems to cope with life effectively. Perhaps short-term memory had no function other than to keep experimental psychologists amused. If that were so, we decided we would rather amuse ourselves in other ways. There had already been a good deal of discussion as to the probable role of short-term memory, and there was a fairly general agreement that its function was to serve as a working memory, a system that allowed several pieces of information to be held in mind at the same time and interrelated. What does this have to do with chess? Well, it has a lot to do with chess. It's affected when you're playing a chess game. When you've got a lot of stuff going on, you got to keep track of. Yeah, it, it's all tied together. Let's go ahead and center this.
Look at the long digits here, long numbers, seven of them. Wim Klein, the human computer specialist in lightning mental arithmetic. The number he's written on the blackboard exactly tallies with the answer given by a computer. And then it tells you the type of information, processing of information and working memory. Forget about all this. The main thing is we're talking about working memory. So when he has to do all of this, I want you guys to see this. When he's doing the mental arithmetic, think of these like chess moves. Like say you were going to calculate um, each one would be a different type of move. They could be uh, a piece or a pawn. A number could represent anything, a piece or a pawn, and it could be just a move. It could be a capture. One of your pieces get captured, whatever. But there's a lot of similarity here to chess. Okay, mic's on, I'm recording. You guys read this over and take this test and see how you do. The test proved very successful for the purpose and could be carried out after a small amount of practice by virtually all the subjects I tested. By counting how many sentences my divers could complete correctly in three minutes, I was able to get a very rapid measure of their mental capability at depth. It also proved to be reasonably sensitive, picking up impairment even even at 100 feet, about the shallowest depth at which one can reliably detect impaired performance. Now, short-term memory is indeed required for reasoning. One should have difficulty doing a sentence checking test of the kind just described while remembering telephone numbers. We were anxious not to overload our subjects, so we began by giving them just one or two items to remember while doing the test. And then notice here where he says when they gave them six numbers to remember, it approaches the average digit span, six numbers, and so ought to occupy a great deal of one's short-term memory system. Like this, 731928 is given a six-digit number and then required to say it out loud and to continue saying it. Meanwhile, a sentence such as A precedes B, B A, was shown to him and he was required to press a key marked true or one marked false. While continuing to rehearse the telephone number, uh, our subjects were initially rather horrified at being asked to do these two things at the same time but somewhat to their surprise, they discovered that they made very few errors on either the digit span or sentence checking task. Hold on, it gets good. With six digit numbers, however, there was a consistent tendency for reasoning to be slowed, though the magnitude of the disruption was much less than we had expected. Was this slowing down evidence that short term memory acts as a working memory system? All things considered, our results seem to be telling us that short-term store is involved in the system used for reasoning, comprehending, and learning, but that this involvement is by no means total. And the two systems appear to have overlapping components, but were by no means entirely entirely dependent on the same limited capacity system. Don't read all that, just forget about that for right now. This week we're just doing a memory segment on uh, working memory.
and you'll notice here make sure you read this part before you do all this before you do the test make sure you read that give you an example um, right here varied from simple active sentences such as a follows b dash a b to which the correct answer is obviously false passive sentences such as b is followed by a to which the correct answer is obviously true to more complex versions such as a is not preceded by b e a to which the answer would be false and so on check off your answers in the true false column you might just write these down on a piece of paper or type them up and then give them to a friend or family member and see how fast they can complete that test go as fast as you can down the column down the other column and just make a check mark true or false and do that while remembering constantly saying that six digit number over and over but for chess purposes what I would have you do is repeat back six moves from a chess game and see what you get and then compare your results with how you work at chess you'll notice there's a lot of similarities yeah a lot yeah just a simple thing like choice A choice B real simple and it's from our book that we showed you before called Your Memory a User's Guide by Alan Badley oh there is one more wanted to show you guys one here on Kasparov thought you'd get a kick out of it now you notice down here that it says um, although a computer has a faultless memory it cannot match the strategic skills of the world's best players we'd certainly say that Kasparov was one of the world's best players if not the best player and we actually have that book by Adrian de Groot you'll find that at PC Chess Club he did a study on chess players and how they think so you can check us out online email us pcchessclub at yahoo.com we're on YouTube we're on Facebook yeah the masters correctly place 90 percent yeah 90 percent and they just took a single five second glimpse I was just kind of moving my finger along underlining some of that for you guys to follow along the parts I wanted you to read and um, the weaker players they only got 40 percent and you notice that it's about patterns notice right there you know they could recall bridge hands electronics experts could do uh, well-designed circuits but in each case the expert is able to organize the material into a meaningful and lawful pattern I'll go ahead and point that out where it says lawful pattern you guys see what you think about that notice that pattern recognition right there see my thumb where it says pattern recognition yeah in order to do so the chess player bridge player or electronics expert brings to bear a rich background of experience notice these words that I just underlined for you guys you just read through the material at a steady rate yeah a lot of lab demos of the importance of organization for memory and um, that's where I just underlined it with my thumb did you guys catch that part where they were talking about unstructured material yeah compared with the recall recall of material with built-in structure and just read through that list at the bottom read through the words twice and then write down as many as you can remember no set order just write down whatever you can remember that's fine
You don't have to get them in the exact order as the book. But imagine if you're having trouble just remembering simple words, something you definitely know. Imagine what a tough time it's going to be if you try to remember a bunch of chess moves. And this applies especially to the openings. Yeah, cover them up. Read them, cover them up. Read them. Then just write them down. You don't have to get them in any certain order. But uh, most people find that the items organized in a hierarchy, the top panel, are much easier to remember than the others. Although it is in fact quite possible to organize the second collection of items in the same way as the first. You'll notice down here we covered this in Harry Lorraine and Jerry Lucas book. The one that we put in the other video called the memory book. Now maybe you guys are starting to see the importance of memory. And how this all ties in to make you a better chess player. Because if you can't remember it, it's not going to do any good. So that's our book from the Your Memory. thought you guys would enjoy that. And this is our other book that we promised to show you. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And there's a... Um, part on the back I want you guys to see that was uh, really good by Anthony Robbins down at the bottom. It's right there. Yeah. As you can see, uh, some of our books, we take a lot of notes and um, we have some of the books that have a lot of notes in them, so they're not going to look brand new, but you could see that they have been put to good use. And that they don't just all sit on a bookshelf. Take a look at that table of contents. And see what you think. That will give you a little sneak peek as to what it was. Oh, that's all acknowledgments. I thought those were like, you know, comments by other people. Here's the other book that we have. Making the Most of Your Child's Teachable Moments. This is another oldie but a goldie. This is a real good book. This is good if you're a parent and you have little kids or a grandparent that deals with little kids or if your job deals with little kids. Like for me, I'm a chess teacher, so I have to deal with little bitty kids. And a lot of times, these are things that we give out to the parents. Just little ideas. We'll bring books like this and say, hey, what do you think about some of these ideas? you think they would work with the kids? And at the same time, they're also getting something they can use with their own kid. Because not every parent or grandparent is going to come to you and say, here's what I need help with, and then ask you about it. So if you put books like this on the table, they can flip through them, and you can kind of also see where the interest is. We'll take a look at one here. Uh, trying to find something that just about everybody could relate to. There you go. About going to bed. Now, if you have to put kids to bed or you know somebody that has to put kids to bed, like maybe you don't have any little kids but you know somebody with little kids, you could um, name off like here five activity starters. Like right there, establish a time for bed and a bedtime routine. Just a little bitty simple thing. Help your child evaluate their day. You know, if your child always seems wide awake at bedtime, use the time for talking or reading together. And there's others. Then right here you'll see, um, I think it's Psalm 4.8. Yeah, Psalm 4.8. There's a little prayer that goes with it. So you can say that little prayer or, you know, teach little kids to say that prayer. It'll be a little Bible verse that will relate all of this. So you got different sections at home, away from home. Then you got uh, nature, teachable moments during seasons, holidays and celebrations, just different ones. So that's our two books and I hope you guys enjoyed. 
This is the uh, Winning Chess Strategies book that we showed before. Just to make sure, you know, that's who the players were. You guys have seen this, I'm sure, if you watched our other videos. If you uh, have Winning Chess Strategies by Yasser Sirwan, just turn to page 132 and follow along. And we'll be showing you this in chess pace. But here, in case you missed the other video, here's the book that we'll be using in this video. So you can see this and you can um, follow along. In fact, if you just resize the uh, little browser window, you can pull up two of them side by side in YouTube. So you could pause one video on the part that has the book and then the other video next to it will be the uh, chess base chess set that we'll be using to cover all this. And that way you guys get the best of both worlds. But that's to let you know we didn't make any of this up. Everything we're reading off to you is from Grandmaster Yasser Sirwan. The uh, $250 Blue Yeti Pro Mic. $50 shock mount, $100 Rode PSA-1 Studio Boom Arm, and I think it's a $40 Blue Yeti Pro Pop Filter. And that along with uh, programs like Adobe Audition and Audacity allows us to have a portable recording studio. This mic will record four times better than CD quality. So I'm going to move this down for a minute so I can get to it. Let's see if we can pull something up for a second. And this is in chess space. If you minimize that ribbon. Check this out for those that don't have chess space. This is what you get at PC Chess Club. You get to use programs like this. This is what we use for chess. Oh yeah. Like right here. Show the show the theme keys for a loaded game. If you do shift control alt C, I believe that's the one. Yeah. It'll pull that up. Similar end games, similar structures, similar moves. Yeah, similar maneuvers. Can't do that with SID or SKID. But this is just one of the many training opportunities that you find at PC Chess Club with the uh, just fabulous software chess base. Analysis, training. If you click that, enable training. You can do that, or here's a good one. Calculate threat and display it with an arrow. Create a threat and display it with arrows. Or you can go over here to view, whatever you want to view. So you can view the notation. You could view the um, player's photos. You can't do that with Skid. You won't have uh, nearly a quarter million photos. Not going to have that. You've also got live book as a separate window and the old reference search that just searches like um, I don't know we'll have to do that in another video it just searches like your main database this one here automatic search pane yeah that one we use a lot the reference search Sometimes we'll use both. We'll have both windows open. Online database with the reference search so that you can tell the difference. Like example would be the online database could have a game that was just played five minutes ago and it would be in the online database where you haven't had a chance to download it yet. Oh yeah, you get this with Chessbase 12. Connect to the cloud engine server and check the available engines. Yep, and you can get like how you want your windows laid out. You can do that. Oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff here you can do. 
Look at all that. Look at that. That is just incredible. Just incredible. This right here, your standard layouts. You could save them or load them. So if you have this layout, how you want everything, awesome. You get a lot of work done. You put all your windows wherever you want everything. Do a whole lot better. Yep, a lot better. And we'll go ahead and detach one of these. Here you guys can see what I'm talking about. You just dock it over here for a second. It'll cut off part of the game, but we don't care about that. The first uh, few moves in the game is where they bring you up to speed. And if you hit reference, you give it a second to load, it will um, show you all these. Show you the games, scores, when it was last played, all of that. You go back to like say the Give seventh move. Here. Check this out. Is this cool or what? Yeah. Try doing that at our Rivals Club. Try doing that at uh, Joplin Chess Club. And see if you get that because you won't. Like right here you get the hotness meter. This tells you what's actually played versus like what you'd find in a database. And right here you're going to get both. At PC Chess Club with Chess Base 12, you're going to get both. You're going to get a list of the best players. And then you're also going to get the frequent players. Who gets frequent flyer mileage? You know? And if you go this way, if you do this, that'll tell you which one is hot and which one is not. Yeah. Just like that, you got all your list of choices that are not real hot. And then this here, you got the better choices. See how these are real close, 29, 28, 28, 14. And then 55.5% winning chance versus a 49.4% winning chance for white. These are both choices for white, but you can see, you look over here, look at some of your best players. You can see the styles, comparison of the styles. Now, if you just want to pull up best players, you do it like that. There you go. This is going along this way. Then you pull it this way where you find, um, for instance, <laughs> not any good best players listed. So you go back to here and look at the hotness meter on both of these. And that right there is going to tell you everything you need. Huge time saver, guys. Huge, huge time saver. Then it'll tell you, like, out of this, all the games that they found, that's how they broke down. Like on this one. Let's see if we can go down. If you were to look at this one, for instance, it only has 34. And then this is your breakdown on those games. You see here where there's 34, but you look down here, you don't get 34. You get, it looks like about 23. And you can add more or less to increase the number of frequent lines. Or you can decrease them. Say, give me just whatever is the most frequent. You pull this up here. Go back. Now you see a completely different breakdown. 
you got everything right there handy ready to go and you also got this little mini board down here too you could try stuff out yeah like say you wanted to look at another game there you go how cool is that guys is that cool or what And it automatically jumps right to it. So let's go ahead and take this, put this back out of the way. That's where I was telling you guys, ninth round, so you know nothing's made up. It's all verified. At PC Chess Club, we're going to verify everything for you. Just for you guys. And then we got one more thing to do, which is go up here, right click, and minimize that ribbon. Okay, guys, it's amazing how quickly a position can collapse when you actively seek to create targets and attack them. This complete game example shows a more typical minority attack battle. And this is from the Aberbach Donner game, uh, round nine. And Yasser Sirwan starts it after the first 11 moves. For those of you at home that have winning chess strategies, Go ahead and turn to page 133 and follow along. Uh, the game is quiet, and as diagram 87 shows, that's what's set up on your board right now. Neither side has any real weaknesses. White decides he has to strike at something, so he starts an immediate minority attack. This move draws the black bishop away from its control of b4, and allows white to safely advance his pawn to that square. Notice here, black's got this bishop on this diagonal. All of that. White needs to get a pawn up here before black does that. Because otherwise it's not going to work. Because if you wait too long, like if you do this, they just go like that. You play a3, black plays a5. Now you take, they take back, you take. Now they push their pawn to b5, and you just have this backward pawn. If, if you can get it, then yes, white will have two isolated pawns. But there's a whole faster way to get, well, a whole lot faster way to get that minority attack going, which is to just trade off the bishop for the knight gets the bishop out of the way and then immediately uh, immediately snap on it just go ahead and take that b4 spot and that's what white did now the game now revolves around the newly created weakness on c6. So white's going to play the key move. What is it? Take a look. See if you can find the key move. White needs to do this right now. Yeah, needs to do it right now. Don't wait around. Do it immediately. See it? There it is. White brings his pieces to bear on the c6 target.
Now, black indirectly defends the c6 pawn. Anybody see how he's indirectly defending the c6 pawn? He's got two pieces covering c6. Anybody see him? Right here, the rook. Yeah, you probably spotted that. But for little kids at home watching, did you spot if the bishop was out of the way, the queen also protects c6? Yeah. Now, rook takes c6, loses. I'll show you why. Loses by force. <coughs> because Yasser says that um, this move is followed by the next move. No matter what white does, whether he goes here or there, or just takes the bishop. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That's the key. Now, you notice there's different odds. Take those off the board. Take the queens off the board. You're gonna, If you're white, you're going to be stuck with a knight against a rook. Not a good deal. So instead he does this. Okay, white brings his knight back into play. Never leave a knight sitting around on the first rank. He also keeps the enemy horse out of c4. This move restricts the scope of the black bishop and gives the king a little room to breathe. Now, 22, rook takes c6 is a real threat. White does this, lets black do that, then white does this. King to g2, black's on the defensive. So white takes a moment off to bring an extra defender to his f3 knight. The king also keeps enemy pieces out of h3. White gains space in the center. He doesn't fear d takes e4 because knight takes e4 just helps to activate his knight. True. White would then have an isolated d-pawn, but none of the black pieces would be in a position to attack it. White keeps taking more and more space, realizing that he's being pushed back on all fronts. Black tries to activate his pieces with c6, c5. Now, black managed to get the rooks off the board, a good trade because the white rooks were more active than their black counterparts. How many people spotted that? Did you notice which rooks were more active? And did you notice that it would be in black's best interest to get all the rooks off the board? But he still has an isolated d pawn. White hastens to block it with his knights, fixing the pawn on d5 and also demonstrating that his knights have found a permanent hole on d4. Remember, always strive to dominate the square directly in front of an isolated pawn. White attacks the bishop and brings everything to bear on d4. This knight is very strong on d4. And now, knight takes c4, oh, no, knight to c4, oops. Knight to c4 loses to the following moves, which wins a piece and a pawn. Can anybody see the combination that wins a piece and a pawn? Here it is. See it? Forking queen and king. White's eye in the pawns on a7 and d5. It's clear that black's bishop is inferior to white's knight's.
Okay, White would not normally be in a hurry to trade off his wonderful knight, but the exposed position of the Black King gives White a chance to start a decisive attack. White's threatening queen takes d5 and knight to d8, forking ki king and queen. Black is helpless against the threat of knight to e5, followed by a check on f7 or g4. If he plays d4, White's easiest answer is king to h2, breaking the pin. Black resigns. White's strategy is paid off. Weak enemy pawns don't just magically appear. You must create them. Thanks for watching.